all <laughs> has and my God will meet all your needs according to the riches and his glory of Christ Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Those of you that are on that side, as he walks by, you'll be blessed with the smell of the charcoal and the hamburgers. That's why we couldn't find him. He was out grilling. <laughs> but uh, it's wonderful to know that God does provide and meet our needs. And that even when we don't have it, God can confirm it through his word and through other people. That uh, when we work for him and for his glory, God is always faithful. Always, always faithful. Hallelujah. If you have your Bibles this morning, turn to the book of Isaiah, please. Isaiah chapter 12, verse number 2. We have been looking at the idea and the subject of problems, the problems that we have in our life, the problems that we face. And today we want to look at the problem of fear. The problem of fear. Fear is something that probably each and every one of us will face in our life at some time or another. Here at New Life, our message, our vision, and our mission as a church is to lift people through the power of the cross. To lift people through the power of the cross. That's why we exist. That is our purpose. That's what we want to do as a church family. And as people face fear in their life, they're going to need a hope. They're going to need uh, an answer. And the answer is always going back to the cross. As we said earlier, it's because of the resurrection of Jesus, it's because of the cross that we have that hope. And so we want to do everything and we want to say everything from that perspective that we're going to lift people through the power of the cross. And so as we look at this message this morning, maybe you can think of somebody that's battling with fear. Maybe you're facing a fear in your own life. And I want you to understand that you need to look to the cross and to God's word for the answers. Franklin Delano Roosevelt said in an address to the nation following an attack on Pearl Harbor, he said, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Now at first that may sound a little bit like a foolish talk or a little double talk, but it's really a good statement. All we have to fear is fear itself because it is that fear that holds us back. It is that fear of, of action that causes us to stay bound up. A lady came up to D.L. Moody after one of his sermons and she said, Pastor Moody, I, I found a wonderful promise in the Bible that has helped me overcome my fear. She said, my verse is found in Psalm chapter 56 verse 3 that says, whenever I am afraid, I will trust in you. Whenever I'm afraid, I will trust in you. To which D.L. Moody replied, I have a better promise than even that. And he quoted our text for this morning, Isaiah chapter 12, verse 2. He said, Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. God is my salvation. I will trust in him and I will not be afraid. For the Lord Jehovah is my strength. He is my song. He also has become my salvation. Whenever I'm afraid, I'll trust in you, said the lady. But God in his word says this. He says, I will trust in the Lord and not be afraid. So which promise is greater? Well, we know this, that all of God's promises are yes and amen. So we can trust him in the fear, but we can also trust him that we will not face that fear. Jesus said in the end times that men's hearts will fail them for things that are about to happen. In the last days, men's hearts will, will be grieved. Men's hearts will be burdened down. They'll be going, where am I going to go? What am I going to do? How am I going to get out of this situation because of what's happening? I believe that if we look around and we observe what is taking place in our world today, we can see that the end of days is close. Can I tell you this? We don't know the time or the hour when Jesus returns, but every day, every minute, every second that ticks by, it's another second and another day, another hour that's closer to his return. We don't know the time, but we need to be prepared. We need to be ready, even though we don't know. But fear can be crippling. Fear can overwhelm us. So let's play a little game this morning. 
Let's see if you can guess these fears. Go ahead, Joe, put that first one up. Do you know what hexacosia, ohexia, oconatoa, hexaphobia is? Anybody? Well, in the last days, if you don't make the rapture, it's a fear that you should have. It's the fear of the number 666. Do you believe people actually have that fear? Second one, pelodophobia. Pelodophobia. Where's Ed Ott? Is Ed here? Oh, my goodness. He was my illustration for the day. I was going to have him stand up, and I was going to have you look at Ed and say, if you're afraid of that, it's because you have the fear of bald people. He's not here, so I can roast him as much as I want. <laughs> Caliogeniophobia. The fear of beautiful women. I'm glad I don't have that fear. <laughs> Gayafreophobia. The fear of crossing bridges. Hobophobia. You should know that one. The fear of hobos. Exactly, Terry Beyer. <laughs> Enosophobia. The fear of criticism. Nyctophobia. Fear of night. Who said that? Phyllis. Fear of night or dark. Dentophobia. You should all know this. The fear of dentists. Why did you all know that one? I tell you. Go to the next one. Geliophobia. Next page there, Joe. Geliophobia. It's not what you think. It's the fear of laughter. I don't think anybody should be afraid of laughter. But the problem is, is people are afraid of people laughing at them. Triskaidekaphobia. Fear of the number 13. Thanatophobia. The fear of death or dying. Ornophobia. Kind of goes with the one before it. The fear of heaven. Whether or not you're going to get there or not. The lilapsophobia. Fear of hurricanes or tornadoes. None of you should have this next one. Pantherophobia. If you do, don't tell. It is the fear of your mother-in-law. <laughs> don't tell. Tropophobia. The fear of making changes. Geronophobia. Fear of old people. Shame on you. You shouldn't be afraid of old people. What are they going to do? Gum you to death? Come on. <laughs> be nice. <laughs> Go to the next page. Iraq. Arachabootyrephobia. It ain't what you think. It is the fear of peanut butter sticking to the roof of your mouth. Oh, okay. Honestly, if you've got that fear, I want to know. <laughs> uh, Didadescaphobia. Fear of going to school. Esopotrophobia. The fear of seeing yourself in a mirror. Which leads to the next fear. Cacophobia. Ugliness. So if you're afraid of seeing yourself in the mirror, it's because you're probably afraid you're going to look ugly. Or it could lead to the next one. Ablatophobia. The fear of washing. I'm glad none of you are afraid to wash. <laughs> Especially after you see yourself in a mirror. And realize, ooh, I don't look good today. <laughs> Last one. Homilophobia. You better not have this one. The fear of sermons or preaching. <laughs> Do not have the fear of sermons or of preaching. That's just a small list of phobias that are out there. But some of them are funny. And yet... They are listed as a phobia because somebody suffers from that. Somebody has that fear in their life. Now, growing up, we kind of instill some fear into our children because some fear can actually be good. 
Some of the fears we face can actually be good. Fear is a good safety emotion to have. Fear can keep us from falling off cliffs. Uh, a while back when I uh, had master's commission and we took some students, we stopped at the Grand Canyon. Uh, Pastor Eric, who's the speed the light director for the Assemblies of God who was here, uh, Pastor Eric didn't have any fear. And Pastor Eric was the one that was standing over the Grand Canyon looking over like, I actually have a picture of him looking over the Grand Canyon like this. He had no fear. I was afraid I was going to have to call his mother and say, hey, your son fell off a cliff and died <laughs> two miles down. But some people... We instill within our children a healthy fear for those things. It alerts us. Healthy fear alerts us to dangers. We warn our children not to go near a busy street. We put a healthy fear in them that they might be hit with a car if they don't stay away from the street. We put a healthy fear in our kids. Don't touch the hot stove because it will burn you. Fear can be used oftentimes for parents as punishment for discipline. It's not the highest motive for, for being good, but it is a start. How many of you growing up heard your mother say, do it one more time, buddy, and wait till your father gets home? <clears throat> I think my mom still says that to me. You just wait until your father gets home. It puts a healthy fear in us that we should probably think twice about what we're doing or that we should stop doing it. Why do we travel at or near the posted speed limit signs? Because we're afraid we might get stopped. Why do we slow down when we see a police car? Even though you're going the speed limit, you still slow down. Why? Why? Because you're afraid that maybe you were speeding. Maybe your speedometer isn't right. You see, fear can be healthy. And one of the healthiest fears is to have a fear of the Lord. A fear of the Lord. Not a fear of God, but a fear of the Lord. Proverbs 9.10 says this. It says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, and it is the fountain of life. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. When we fear God, in other words, uh, money translations change that to when we reverence God, when we have a holy uh, understanding of who He is, then it brings us to a place where we desire to know Him. We desire the knowledge that His Word can give to us. And when we have that healthy fear... It causes us to have a life that is like a fountain that is overflowing, that is bubbling with the goodness of the Lord. It's a proper respect. It's a proper reverence for God. It's a kind of fear that opens the, the way to a, a, an abundant life in Jesus Christ. But the kind of fear that we see here in Isaiah chapter 12 is he's talking about is a fear that actually paralyzes people. It's a fear that gets into the heart and the mind and it creates tension. It creates worry. It's a fear that keeps people from really enjoying life the way that God desires us to enjoy it according to Proverbs chapter 9. A fear that keeps us from experiencing all that God has for us. For most people, a fear experience is unpleasant. Having a fear experience, when you're caught in that, that experience of fear, it, it, it's paralyzing. It's like, oh, what am I going to do? I can't take this anymore. Like closing your eyes and clenching your fists and not moving is going to make it go away somehow. But fear can paralyze us. Phobias attach fear experiences to a variety of things. I said a couple weeks ago, you can't Google wisdom, but you can Google phobias. And if you do, you'll find that there are hundreds, almost a thousand different kinds of phobias that will be listed. Having a fear experience is so unpleasant that a person begins to fear having that experience in their life again. The very thought of the fear experience produces fear. And that's what FDR was saying in his address to the nation. Fear only produces more fear. Fear in your life only produces more fear, more cause for concern. So what is it that causes fear in our lives? What causes fear? Sometimes fear is caused because of a guilty conscience. Sometimes fear is caused because of a guilty conscience. In Genesis, the Bible tells us that Adam and Eve sinned. And when they sinned, the Bible says they recognized that, that they were naked. They recognized that, that they had done something wrong. And it says they went and they hid. 
You see, their conscience all of a sudden said, "Uh uh-oh, something's wrong. I did something bad. And they tried to hide it from God. They tried to keep themselves from God. They became afraid because they knew something had happened. Fear in our lives is often caused by a guilty conscience. When I was growing up, I've shared this story before. I got mad at my sister and punched a hole through my door in my bedroom. I was afraid that my parents were going to find out. I was afraid what my parents were going to do to me. So I quickly got two of my Christian posters and hung it on the other side of the door. I was a good Christian boy. My parents didn't know until they went to move, and they took those posters down. And they realized, oh, Wayne must have been afraid of what we were going to do to him. You see, fear can be caused by a guilty conscience. Have you ever done something? Did you ever do something as a child and like, oh no, my, oh, my mom, if they find out, if my mom and dad find out, I'm in big trouble. Friends, we should have that same thing with God as well. If God finds out, oh no, oh God, oh, I hope God doesn't know. Hope God doesn't find. Friends, let me tell you, God knows before he even committed it. <laughs> So we have to guard our hearts against that. We have to guard our hearts against having a guilty conscience. Fear is caused by a guilty conscience. Number two, oftentimes fear can be caused by ignorance. Just not knowing. Being ignorant to a a, a situation. Growing up, many children, as as they're little, they they will use this excuse, Mom and Dad, I, I can't go to sleep. I have to have the light on. I'm afraid that there's monsters in the bed. There's boogeyman in the closets. They're afraid because of ignorance. They don't realize that those things don't even exist. And so we have to come in and we have to comfort them. We have to say, say, look, there's nothing under the bed. There's nothing in the closets. We have to prove to them that those things aren't there. Children are afraid of the dark because all of a sudden a shadow on a bright moonlit night will cause the tree to move across the room and it has branches that go like this. And they're afraid of a tree limb. Why? Because they don't realize what's happening. People often are afraid of dying in the future because it is unknown to them. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you don't have a relationship with him, the fear of death is very real because you're like, I don't know, am I right? Did I do enough good works? Did I, is there a God or isn't there a God? I'm not sure. Did I make it? Will I get to heaven? They're ignorant towards the things of God and towards heaven, and so they become afraid. For heaven, for death, heaven for the Christian is the ultimate home. And we should not fear death. As a believer, you should not fear death. But when that time comes, you should say, hallelujah, I am going home. I'm leaving this messed up world. I'm leaving all those fears behind, and I'm going to see my Savior face to face. See, when we get rid of that fear, we can focus on the hope that we have. I would say this, that the real cause of fear, however, is actually unbelief. The biggest cause of fear is unbelief. Have you ever felt as if you were wandering alone in the dark, not knowing what disasters were just waiting for you in the shadows, or when light would ever shine again? You're just like, what is going to happen? I don't know where I'm going. I don't know what is taking place. What's going to happen to me? What's going to happen in my life? I don't know what's going to take place. In the book of Matthew, we read a story of Jesus, and he says to the disciples, hey, let's set out on the boat. Let's set out for the other side. And they get in this boat, and they're on their way over, and and Jesus had been preaching and teaching, and and Jesus had, had gone down, and he'd gone into the lower part of the boat, and there he began to fall asleep, and he slept. And while he was sleeping, the Bible says that a storm began to stir on the waters. A storm began to arise. And what did did these brave, God-fearing followers of Jesus Christ do? Oh, no, we're going to die. We're going to die. Peter, where's Jesus? Why is it? Where is he? Why is he leaving us up here? Why is he taking us out here to die? The storm arose out on the sea. And the first thing we see is that the disciples panic. They become full of fear. There were no life jackets. There were no life bolts. They felt like they were at the complete mercy of the storm. All the while recognizing, not recognizing that the one who could control the storm was in the belly of the boats. They feared what they saw with their eyes rather than who they knew 
in their life. Matthew chapter 8, in a panic, they called out for Jesus, saying, Lord, save us. Jesus, get out here. We're all going to drown. Verse 25, it tells us that, that Jesus woke from his sleep. And I love this. Jesus didn't say, oh my goodness, oh, you're right. I got to do something right now. No, Jesus got up and he looked at these crazy disciples, these guys that he had said, come and follow me. He looks at me and goes, come on, guys. You of little faith, why are you so afraid? Jesus doesn't get up out of the bottom of the boat. He doesn't walk up onto the mast, and he doesn't go, peace be still. No, he says, come on, guys, where is your faith? Why are you so afraid? You see, sometimes in the midst of the storm, Jesus needs us to recognize that there is no reason to fear the storm that is around us. Sometimes in the midst of the storm, sometimes we need to be rebuked a little bit. Sometimes we need to, to, to allow for Jesus to speak to our life and say, hey, hold on a second. Who's in control of your life, the storm or me? And it's only after he rebukes the disciples, it's only after he says to them, where's your faith? That he then says to the storm, to the waves, to the raging sea, peace. Be still. Peace. Be still. Many times we want God to fix our problems instantly. Oh God, come right now. Fix my problem. We want the raging waters around us to cease immediately. Yet sometimes in the middle of the crashing waves, God has a word for us. God has a word that he needs to speak into our heart, whether through his word or whether through his spirits. He wants us to deep in our faith. He wants us to grow in him before he intervenes. Some of you may be going, man, I'm going through such a hard time right now. I'm, I'm struggling with this. I have this fear. I'm, I'm facing all these things, and I don't understand why. Sometimes maybe it's because God is working, and God is saying, come on, I'm building your faith. I'm preparing you for the next thing. I'm preparing you for the next thing. Sometimes in the middle of the waves, we just need to say, okay, God, I know you're here. He wants us to follow in faith no matter how dark our circumstances. You see, when Jesus spoke to the disciples, he acknowledged that their fears were great. He didn't discount their fear. He recognized, your fear is great. Man, what's wrong with you? Your fear is overwhelming you. And he said, listen, you don't have to allow that fear to control you. He said, you need to have more faith. Your faith is little and your fear is great. Dr. Michael Youssef put it this way. He said, the relationship between faith and fear is like a seesaw. When one is up, the other is down. So when we allow fear to rise, our faith will decline. But the opposite is true as well. When we increase our faith, then fear will fall. When we increase our faith, fear will fall. But if we allow for fear to control us, if we allow for fear to raise us, then our faith will become weaker and weaker and weaker. If we're afraid, it's often a sign of weak faith. So how are we able to conquer our fears? How are we able to say, I am not going to live in this fear any longer. Lord, I'm going to put my trust in you. Lord, I don't want this fear in my life anymore. It's very simple. Victory over fear equals faith in God. Victory over fear in your life equals having faith in God. There's all kinds of fears. There's all kinds of things that you face, but if you have faith in God, those fears will begin to dissipate. Those fears will begin to drift away, and pretty soon you can step out and say, hey, I don't even know what I was afraid of. I don't know why I even feared that. We must look by faith at God. If we are to overcome fear, we must get our eyes off of ourselves. If you want to overcome fear, you need to get your eyes off of your own feelings. If you want to overcome fear, you need to get your eyes off of the problems and get them on to the one that can calm the storm. Put your eyes and put your faith in the one who can bring the hope, who can say to the storm, peace, be still. You need to put your faith in God. You need to also fix your eyes upon God. Fix your eyes on him. You see, they were focused on the storm around them. And Jesus said, don't look at the storm. Look at me. And it's when they called him out of the boat that Jesus calmed the storm. 
We need to fix our eyes upon God. In the Old Testament, Moses, as they were getting ready to enter into the promised land, Moses sent out the, the 12 spies to go in and to, to, to scout out Canaan land, the, the promised land for the children of Israel. And the 12 spies from the 12 tribes went into the, to the land of Canaan. And as they went in, they, they looked around and they were overwhelmed. And they looked and they saw the massive wall. They looked and they saw the, the people, they were larger. They looked and they saw the weaponry. They saw the, 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 the massiveness of how this conquest could not actually happen. And the Bible says they came back and they reported to Moses. Ten of them said, Moses... There is no way we can go into the land. They are like giants in the land. They saw the enemy soldiers, and they said, they're too big for us to conquer. They saw the walls of the city, and they said, those walls are way too high. We'll never get through. But there were two. There were two that said, huh, wait a second. I don't know what you saw, but that's not what I saw. I saw a people that can be defeated. I saw a wall that can come down. I saw a land that was flowing with milk and honey. I saw grapes that were so large that it took two men to carry the bushels. I saw a city that was prepared just for us. Why did the two see all the good things? And why did the ten see the bad? Because the ten were looking at what was actually there while the two were looking up a little bit higher and saying, ooh, I see that God has prepared this place for us. You see, you can focus on the problem or you can focus on the solution. You can focus on the fear, or you can focus on having faith in God. See, if those ten would have only lifted their eyes a little bit higher, they would have seen God, who was far above all that was happening. They would have seen God, who said, I will deliver this land into your hands. We need to fix our eyes on the Lord. The Bible says, fix your eyes on Jesus Christ, the author and the finisher of your faith. Fixing our eyes on him, the author in other words, the one who begins to, to, to scribe out your life and the finisher of your faith. Don't fix your eyes on the fear and the outcome that will happen if you give into it. Fix your eyes on him. Number three, we must lay hold of God's word. If you want to overcome that fear in your life, you need to have faith in God, you need to fix your eyes on God, and you need to lay hold of this word, this powerful word, because the word of God has so much in it that can help us. The word of God has so much in it that can lead us through those times of fear. Romans chapter 10 verse 17 says this, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing through the word of God. So many people want a solution. So many people want to calm that fear. And they will run to this person. They'll run to that person. They'll run to, to this idea. They'll run to that idea. Never once thinking, oh, I should run to the Bible. When the Bible has all the answers. When the Bible strengthens us. When the Bible helps us get through our fears. Church, when we read and study God's word, we feed our faith, not our fear. We strengthen our faith. And our fear begins to diminish. When we read and study God's word, it builds up that hope that we have in him. And there is nothing we face, there is nothing that can come our way that can say, oh, I'm going to put you down. Because we declare, no, God's word says, greater is he that is in me than he that's in the world. How many of you realize that fear is in the world? That fear is of the enemy. But Christ who lives in you is greater than all those fears, greater than anything in this world. How do we overcome we have to look to his words. Stop turning to Facebook, Instagram, CNN, Fox News. Stop turning to them to answer your fears because they will only weaken your faith. Multimedia, social media, all it does is strengthen the fear that you have. When you look to God's words, it brings it under control. And you can say, there is nothing that my God has not prepared for. We read that passage from Revelation this morning. Behold, come. The Father says, come. He doesn't say, sit back and take what's coming. He says, no, come. Come out from that. Come to me, and I will provide. We need to remember his promises, finally. Remember his promises. Isaiah chapter 43, verses 1 and 2 says this. But now, thus says the Lord who created you, O Jacob, 
And he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flame scorch you, for I am the Lord your God. Let me say it again. This is what God says. Jacob, he who formed you. O Israel, all of you people, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. Child, you are mine. Read that passage. Fear not. God is saying, fear not. Don't be afraid, Wayne, because I have called you. Wayne, you are my child. You don't have to fear. Put your name in there and say, this is what God has for me. I do not have to fear. I don't have to be afraid. When you walk through the fires, don't worry. I'll be there. The flames will not consume you. They, will, they won't overcome you when you walk through the waters. Don't worry. They're not going to overshadow you. They're not going to overflow you. You will be able to walk through unburned. The flame won't scorch you, and you will not drown. But so many times we're so consumed. We're so fixated on the flames. Like, oh, I'm going to burn. I'm going to die. God has a plan. He has a purpose. And he wants us to focus our faith on him. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were threatened with fire. They were threatened, hey, you're going to be thrown into the fiery furnace, and you're going to be burned up if you don't bow down to that image. They said, eh, phew, I don't care. Our faith in God is more, is greater than our fear of some furnace. Our faith in our God is greater than the fear of the furnace, and our God will see us through. And if he doesn't, we'll just be with him. What are you going to do? You can't threaten a Christian with heaven. Pastor Paul Graeber used to say that all the time. You can't threaten a Christian with heaven. Because if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, that's where you're going to end up. So do, stop being afraid of all these things. They didn't bow. The Bible says they were taken and thrown into that fiery furnace. And while they were in there, the king looked and said, wait a second, how many do we throw in? Three? But why do I see four? The four is like the son of man. Why? Because when we're thrown into the fiery furnace, Jesus is right there with us. We don't have to fear. The Bible says that those that threw him in, they were burned up. They were consumed right away. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who made out, came out of that furnace, they didn't even smell like smoke. George Moyer and Mike McGuire, they're smelling like cookout smoke right now because they're close to the fire. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they didn't smell. Why? Because the Son of Man was there with them. We need to remember this promise. We used to sing this as a, a song uh, in the church. It says, when you walk through the waters, I will be there. And through the flame, you'll not, no way, be drowned. You'll not, no way, be burned. For I am with you, fear not. Anybody remember that? Okay, six of you, hallelujah. <laughs> One of the best ways to put God's promises of his word, learn songs that go with them. Man, we, we teach our kids songs that are Bible songs. Many of the songs you remember are songs that were taken from scripture. And when you need that, that promise just comes out. We need to pray. Lastly, we need to pray and surrender to the Holy Spirit. Fear is sin. The Bible tells us fear is sin. And sin must be confessed and sin must be repented of in order to be forgiven. 2 Timothy 1.7 says this, For God has not given us a spirit of fear. Oh, come on. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and of a sound mind. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. When we allow fear to control our mind, it will take us in every direction, and we will be freaking out about every crazy, stupid thing that's out there. God has not given you that spirit of fear. It is the enemy that fills you with fear. But God has given us a spirit of power and love and of a sound mind. Church, the Holy Spirit can give us that power that we need to overcome our fear. 1 John chapter 4, verse 18 says, There is no fear in love, 
But perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. Perfect love casts out all fear. Who is love? God is love. If you have a relationship with God the Father, if you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, if you have a relationship with the Holy Spirit, then that, the, the, the Trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, they're going to push out all that fear because there is no fear in God. A mother who may be frightened, I've seen this. A mother who's frightened, they're in the kitchen. Ah! Afraid of a mouse. That mother, that same one that was afraid of a mouse, if there's a lion coming for her son or her daughter, they will stand between that lion to save that child. Why? Because perfect love. That love drives her to stand between. You see, God the Father loved you so much that he said, I'm going to send my son to die on the cross. I'm going to send my son to stand between heaven and hell. I'm going to send my son out of perfect love to stand in the gap so that you don't have to face the burning flames. We need to learn that only the power of love can truly overcome fear. Fear is an emotion. It's a feeling. We're commanded to be led by the Spirit not by the flesh. Walk in the Spirit, not in the world. The fear of God, which means loving and respectful obedience towards Him, is the one fear that eliminates all others. Having a healthy reverence, a healthy fear of God, will eliminate all the others. So what do you fear today? What is that fear in your life today? The answer is, to solve that is to love God enough to overcome it. Love God enough to allow him to overcome that fear in your life. Focus on him. Focus on Jesus. Focus on the one who gave his life. Lay hold of his promises. Lay hold of his word this morning. The promises of his words are yes and amen. A pastor friend from Cuba said there are 365 days in the year. There's 365 passages of scripture that tell us do not fear. Don't fear. Don't worry. Don't fret. Trust in God. Trust in his words. And ultimately, you have to yield to the Holy Spirit. You can have the word. You can know the word. You can say, oh, I know what that fear is. And I know it's not of God. But until you yield to the Holy Spirit in your life, it doesn't mean that you'll conquer it. You see, when we begin to do this, when we begin to have faith, when we begin to put God's word and when we begin to fix our eyes on him and when we begin to rely on the Holy Spirit, then, listen, then there will be no room for fear in your life. Why? Because perfect love casts out fear. And the more love of the Father you have, the more love of Jesus, the more of the Holy Spirit you have in your life, it expels room for fear to ever even take hold. What fears do you have? Give them to the Lord. Say, Lord, this is crazy. I know it's of the enemy. I know, I know you don't want me to have it. So, Lord, I give it to you. I surrender it to you today. Take this fear that's gripping me. Take this torment that I put myself through for so long, and, Lord, deliver me from it as I put your word as I put your will, as I put your spirit fully into my life. For he who the Son sets free is free indeed. He who the Son sets free is free indeed. Not free maybe, not free possibly. Not you might have a chance to get out of the situation. No, God says you are free indeed. He who the Son sets free. Is free indeed. Would you bow your heads this morning? Worship team, would you come? There are so many problems we face in our life, and yet God has a solution for all of them. I could have taken time this morning and so many stories in the Word of God about fear. 
so many men and so many women in the Word have been used to describe the fears that they faced. And it was only when they came to God, when they came to Jesus, that those fears were cast out. It was only when they took the time to take their eyes off of the fear and have faith that God would set them free. Elijah was afraid of Jezebel, crazy woman. He was afraid of her. Oh, she's going to kill me. He just called fire down from heaven, consumed the altar, and wiped out half of the, the people that were there, of the enemy. And yet he runs away afraid. Because a woman said, I'm coming after you. See, he fixed his eyes on the person, not on the solution. Maybe that's you. You fixed your eyes on a situation, a person. Even though you just called down fire from heaven. Even though you just overcome one fear, another one has popped up and you're like, oh, I'm not sure what I'm going to do. time to take your eyes off that fear and fix your eyes on Jesus. You see, fear cripples us. Fear holds us back from accomplishing what God desires. What more? What more could you do for God? What more could you do for your family? What more could you do for your community? What more could you do for your church? What more could you do for the kingdom of heaven? If you would just say to that fear, be moved. Be cast out. In the name of Jesus. Will you allow your faith to arise so that the fear will be pushed down? Or are you just going to keep letting that fear build and build and build until it cripples you? Until it holds you captive? Perfect love casts out all fear. Maybe you're here this morning and during this message you heard me talk about how as a Christian we don't have anything to fear about heaven or hell because as a Christian we know that heaven awaits us. But maybe you're here and you haven't given your life to Jesus today. Maybe you've been living, maybe you came into this room wondering about your life and wondering whether or not you've been good enough, whether or not your works or your deeds will get you into heaven. Friends, I can tell you this, that there are no good works, there are no good deeds that you can ever do that will qualify you for heaven. There is not enough good in me. There is not enough good in you to get you to heaven. There was only enough good in one, and his name was Jesus. God said to his son, go to earth. Lay down your life as a pure spotless lamb for the forgiveness of many. You see, it's because of what Jesus did on the cross that we are able to be lifted today. It's because of what he did on the cross that we can say to that fear, be gone. And we can allow our faith to arise. So today, if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, I want to give you that opportunity to get that fear out of your life. To get that fear of where are you going to go when you die. To have that removed from your life this day because you can say yes to Jesus. Come into my life. Forgive me of my sins. I believe that you died for me. If that's you this morning, all over this room, the front to the left, the right to the back. If that's you, you say, Pastor, I, I need to know. Today I want to re- get rid of that fear in my life, and I want to know him as my Savior so that I can be with him in heaven. If that's you and you want to pray this prayer this morning, would you just slip up a hand wherever you're at? Here in the back, yes. Anyone else? Today I want to get that fear out of my life, and I want to know him as my Savior. I want to know that I know that I know that I'm going to heaven, that I won't fear death, when it comes knocking. But I'll be ready to go. I'll be ready to go. Anyone else? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.
going to pray in just a moment. But before we do that, you don't need to raise your hand this morning. This is kind of between you and the Lord. How many of you this morning would, just in your own heart, in your own life, you say there's, a, there's an unhealthy fear or two in your life? There's an unhealthy fear that's holding you back, that's crippling you. Today, you just want to give it over to God. Today, you're going to hear the rebuke of the Lord saying, why are you worried about the storm? And you're going to say, okay, God, you, you, you pointed it out. And so now I'm going to let you step on to the mast of my ship and speak peace. Speak peace. Calm that storm, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Take that fear away in the name of Jesus. For, Lord, your word is powerful. It is full of promises that tell us that your love, your perfect love, casts out all the fear. All the fear be gone in the name of Jesus. Right now, just tell that fear to be gone in Jesus' name. Whatever it is, just tell it to be gone in Jesus' name. Fear of the dark, be gone in Jesus' name. Fear of failure, be gone in Jesus' name. Fear of comparing to others, be gone in Jesus' name. Fear of, uh, uh, of doubt, be gone in the name of Jesus. Fear of finances, be gone in the name of Jesus. Whatever it is, just tell them, it be gone in the name of Jesus. Because Jesus is love, and Jesus will cast out that fear. But as you speak that this morning, as you proclaim that with your lips, you've got to believe it in your heart. You've got to allow that faith to arise up inside of you. Because if you don't, that fear is just going to come back again. So when it starts to come back, no go. I've already told you to be gone in the name of Jesus. Be gone in the name of Jesus. Father, I thank you. Lord, that your word deals with this because it's something we all face. If it wasn't something we faced, you wouldn't have it in your word to say this is how to overcome. So Lord, we give you the praise. So let's just join our hearts in prayer. Let's stand across this sanctuary this morning. And we're going to join our hearts in prayer and we're going to pray a prayer of salvation. If you've raised your hand, maybe you didn't raise your hand, but now you just feel compelled. I need to ask Jesus into my life. And as we pray, maybe that fear is still there and you just need to get rid of it, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Can we just ask him now? Dear God, Dear God. Dear God. today I surrender my life to you. Today I surrender my life to you. Today I choose, today I choose. to believe that Jesus is my Savior. To believe that Jesus is my Savior. I ask you to forgive me of all my sins. I ask you to forgive me from all my sins. Because my sin has made me guilty. Has made me guilty. And it has caused me to fear. And it's caused me to fear. Whether I'd be in heaven or hell. But now I know. Now I know. That because I am forgiven. Because I am forgiven. My eternity is in heaven. My eternity is in heaven. And that fear of death is gone. And now I have life. I have new life. I have abundant life. I have abundant life. That you, have promised. that you have promised. Lord, thank you for saving me. Thank you for saving me. Let's continue to pray. Dear God, Dear God you know the fear I face. You know the fear I face. And I know the God I serve. And I know the God I serve. So right now, so right now I ask in Jesus' name, I ask in Jesus name that those fears be gone. That those fears be gone. And that they will be replaced with faith. They would be replaced with faith. They would be replaced with your words. They would be with your, word. with your promises. With your promises. And, that I would know and I would know that my God is greater, my God is greater than all my fears, all my, fears, all my, doubts, all my doubts, and all my trials. And I stand on that promise. I stand on that promise. In Jesus' name. In Jesus name. Amen. 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 Our God is powerful. He is mighty to save. And He can set you free from those fears. <laughs> he can set you free from those fears, whatever they are. But we have to be bold enough to say, eh, eh, no more devil. Kick the devil to the side. Kick the fear to the side. And proclaim, Lord, you 
are more than enough. We trust in him each and every day, living in his promises day to day. We're going to sing this song together as we sing it. Maybe there's a fear that's just holding on. Maybe you need to come and lay that fear down at this altar. You just need to kneel down. You need to stand here and you say, you know what, fear of whatever. I'm blaming you at the altar. You see, in the Old Testament, they would, they would bring that sacrifice to the altar and that sacrifice would be consumed, gone, gone. And the Bible says that as that sacrifice went up, that burning sacrifice, it was like a sweet aroma unto God. Why? Because they were getting rid of something disgusting in their life and saying, I want more of you, Lord. So maybe this morning you need to come. As we sing this, let's just celebrate. And then we'll close in prayer in just a moment. Hallelujah. Lord, I come to you. Let my heart be changed. Re of his word. Thank you, Jesus, that you fill us with that hope. Thank you, Jesus. 
Lord, it is the power of your love that compels us. It is the power of your love that casts out all fear. And so, Lord, we go forth from this place. We go out celebrating the work that you have accomplished on the cross. So let the cross of Jesus lift us up in hope and in power. Father, as we go and spend time in fellowship, as we go and spend time eating and just enjoying the company of our brothers and sisters in the Lord, Lord, may we be refreshed. May we just be encouraged because of what you're doing in our hearts and our lives. Lord, bless this food to our bodies. May it nourish us and strengthen us. Lord, as we sit around tables talking, as we play games, Lord God, may we just draw closer to each other and closer to you. For Lord, you're building your church. You're building your church for these last days. And so Lord, we live to glorify you and to exalt you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. And amen. Hallelujah. Uh, as you go...